Thank you very much. Thanks very, very much. I, <clears throat> I appreciate that. I'm, I'm going to read a little bit from chapter 7 of Back to Blood. And the title of that uh, chapter is The Mattress. This was the sort of thing the chief never talked about to anybody. Anybody. He was not a fool, after all. People would sooner talk about their sex lives. Sometimes among, among cops, you couldn't shut them up. Or their money, or their messy marriages, or their sins in the eyes of God. About anything other than, the, than about their status in this world, their place in the social order, their prestige or their mortifying lack of it, the respect they get, the respect they don't get, the jealousy and resentment of those who wallow in respect everywhere they set foot. All this went through the chief's mind in a single blip as his driver, Sergeant Sanchez, pulled up in front of City Hall and the chief's official Escalade. Miami City Hall was a curiously small white building that stood alone on a half acre rectangle of landfill sticking out into Biscayne Bay. The Escalade, on the other hand, that was a huge brute, all black, with darkened windows and without a single marking to indicate that it was a police vehicle. Only a low black bar across the roof containing a lineup of spotlights and flasher lights <coughs> and lenses uh, con and a light on the dashboard no bigger than a quarter emitting some sort of ominous X-ray uh, radiation. As soon as they stopped, the, the chief fairly sprang from the passenger seat. Um, he was in front next to Sergeant Sanchez. The last thing in the world that he wanted the world to think was that he was an old coot who had to be chauffeured around. Like so many men in his mid-40s, he wanted to look young, athletic, virile, and so he sprang, imagining himself a lion or a tiger or a panther, uh, a vision of lithe strength in any case. What a sight it was, or so he was convinced. He couldn't very well ask anybody, could he? He wore a darkest blue military-style shirt, no, <coughs> um, uh, black, uh, sh black shoes and dark uh, wraparound sunglasses, no jacket. This was Miami. 10 o'clock on a September morning, and the cosmic heat lamp was already high overhead, and it was already 88 degrees out here. On each side of his neck, which he figured looked as thick as a tree trunk, a row of four gold stars ran along each side of his navy blue collar. A galaxy of eight stars in all. And atop that starry tree trunk was his dark face. There were six feet, four inches, and 230 pounds of him, with big, wide shoulders. And he was unmistakably African-American and he was chief of police. Oh yeah, how they stared, all those people going in and out of City Hall, and he loved it. The Escalade was in the traffic circle right in front of the entrance. The chief stepped out on the curb. He stopped for a moment. He lifted his arms out to the side with bent elbows, thrust his shoulders back as far as they'd go, and took a deep breath. <clears throat> he looked like he looked like he was stretching after being cooped up in the car. In fact, he was forcing his chest to bulge out full blown. He bet that made him look twice as mighty. But of course, he couldn't very well ask anybody, could he? He was still in mid-stretch when, hey, chief, it was a young man he had, who had City Hall lifer written all over him. Light skin, probably Cuban, emerging from the entrance and beaming a smile of homage at him and, paying his respects with a wave that began at his forehead and turned him <clears throat> into half a salute. Had he ever laid eyes on this kid before? He worked in a bureau of, what, what the hell was it? Anyway, he was paying homage. A chief blessed him with a lordly smile and said, hi, big guy. He had barely rolled his shoulders forward into a normal position when a middle-aged couple passed him. They were on their way into City Hall, and they looked Cuban too. The man swung his head around and sang out, How's it going, Chief? Homage. 
The chief blessed him with a lordly smile and favored him with a, hi, big guy. In rapid succession, uh, another, hey, chief, how you doing, chief? And then a high sigh, short for Cyrus, his first name. And, and, and a keep him flying sigh, and he hadn't even reached the door yet. The citizens seemed to enjoy playing, uh, paying homage with uh, salutations that rhymed with sigh. His last name, Booker, was too much for their poetic powers, which was just as well as he saw it. Otherwise, everything they called him would be mockery or a racial or personal insult. Mooker, spooker, kooker, hooker. No, it was just as well. The chief said, hi, big guy. Hi, big guy. Hi, big guy. Hi, big guy. Homage. The chief was in an excellent mood this morning. The mayor had summoned him here to City Hall for a little policy meeting concerning this Marine Patrol officer, Nestor Camacho, uh, and that man on the mast business. He broke into a big smile for nobody's benefit but his own. It was going to be amusing to watch old Dionisio squirm whenever things were going bad. <coughs> Uh, for the mayor or driving him crazy, the chief thought of him by his real name, Dionisio Cruz. The mayor had done everything in the world to make the, uh, to make the whole world think of him as just plain Dio, the way William Jefferson Clinton had become Bill and Robert Dole had become Bob. Uh, the mayor figured Dionisio, the fi five-syllable name of the Greek god of wine and party boys, was too unusual and too big a bellyful for a politician. He was only 5'6", had a very luxurious paunch, but he had enormous energy <clears throat> and the best uh, political antenna in the business, a loud voice and an egotistical bonhomie uh, that could take over an entire <coughs> room uh, full of people and swallow them whole. All of that was quite okay with the chief. He had no illusions concerning the politics of the situation. He was not Miami's first African-American police chief, but the fourth. The concern was not the African-American vote, which didn't amount to much anyway. The concern was riots. In 1980, a Cuban cop was accused of murdering an African-American businessman who was already lying on the ground in police custody by bludgeoning his head until it split open and you could see his brains. Two of his uh, Cuban fellow cops testified against him at, at his trial, saying they were there and they saw him do it. But an all-white jury found him innocent anyway, and he left the courtroom free as a bird. This set off four days of riots and wholesale slaughter in Liberty City, the worst riot in the history of Miami and perhaps the countries. A whole string of riots ensued in Miami in the 1980s and beyond. In case after case, you had Cuban cops accused of knocking African-Americans' lights out. Liberty City, Overtown, and, in, and other African neighborhoods, African-American neighborhoods, became lit fuses, and the bomb always went off. The latest riot was just two years ago. After that, when Dio Cruz decided to promote Assistant Chief Cyrus Booker to chief, see, one of your own, not one of ours, runs the entire police department. That was pretty transparent stuff. At the same time, there were five African-American assistant chiefs in the department, and the mayor had chosen me. Dio Cruz sincerely liked him and admired him, or so the chief chose to believe, and he believed it sincerely. But this morning, thank God, it was his pal and admirer, Denisio himself, who was caught in a bind by his own people. Usually it was him, the chief, Outsiders, usually white people, used to talk to him with the assumption that black folks, the African-American community, was the currently enlightened phrase, and white folks uttered it like they were walking across a bed of exploded light bulb shards. Must be awfully proud that one of your own now heads the police force. Well, if they were so proud of him, they had a funny way of showing it. Every time a recruiter approached a young African-American and, and suggested he might make a terrific cop, the chief had gone on this mission himself. The guy would say, why would I want to be a traitor to my own people? Or something close to that. One kid had been so brazen as to look the chief in his black face and say, 
Tell me why the fuck I want to help the fucking Cubans beat up on my brothers. No, if he had any respect from the streets, from the black community, it was only because he was hooked up to the power, currently. He had the power of, of the man, currently. Uh -huh. You don't be jacking with the traitor in chief, man. He come after you and you be committing suicide by cop. You be committing suicide by getting a police bullet shot clear through your chest and they be finding a gun on your corpse you didn't even know you had. And they say you pull this gun you never knew you had on a cop and you be giving them no choice. They got to act in self-defense. You don't know you're committing suicide, but that's what you did when you pulled this gun you didn't know you got and aim it at the suicide squad. Know what I'm saying? But hell, you ain't even listening. Oh, I'm sorry, brother. Ain't no way you be listening to nothing no more. The Cuban suicide squads. And so what did that make him? Traitor in chief. He was happy that this time it was the mayor who had his dick caught in the door. As he headed inside for the big policy meeting, he happened to glance up at the facade of City Hall and his smile grew big, big enough for the gawkers to wonder what the chief of police thought was so funny. Miami's was the weirdest of all the big city halls in the country. The big city city halls, excuse me. If you ask Cy Booker, it was a little two-story white stucco building done in the art modern style, now called Art Deco, fashionable in the 1920s and the 1930s, Pan American Airways had built it in 1938 as a terminal for their new fleet of seaplanes, which touched down and took off from, from Biscayne Bay upon their bulbous pontoon feet. Uh, <clears throat> but the seaplane future fizzled, and the city took over the building in 1954 and made it an art, art modern in the city hall, and left the Pan Am logo on, the, on it. Yeah, and, and not just in one place either. The logo, uh, the globe of the world, a loft with art modern, modern wings on it and launched by the art modern rays of the sun rising beneath it. This typical art modern touch, promising a radiant future lit up by man's uh, Promethean reach for the stars, was repeated endlessly, creating a frieze that wrapped around the entire building. Pan Am, Pan Am, Pan Am, Pan Am, Pan Am, Pan Am, beneath the cornice. There was something gloriously goofy about it. A big city, city hall proudly displaying a now defunct airline's seaplane terminal logo. But this was Miami and uh, there you had it. The mayor's conference room upstairs was not like any other big city's mayoral conference room either. The ceiling was low and there was no table, just a random collection of chairs varying in size and comfort. It was more like a slightly beat up little lounge in an aging athletic club. All the rooms up here, including the mayor's own office, were small and cramped. No doubt they were originally occupied by the worker daddies who did the accounting, procurement, and maintenance side of the seaplane operation. Now it was the mayor's domain. A phrase much resented in city halls across the country popped into the chief's head, good enough for government work. As he drew closer, he could see through the doorway. The mayor was already there with his uh, communications director as uh, City Hall PR Flax were now titled, a tall, slender man named Ephraim Portuando. He could have been handsome if he weren't so doer. And Rinaldo Bosch, a small pear-shaped man, only 40 years old or so, but bald as a clerk. He was the city manager, a title that didn't mean much when a man like Dionisio Cruz was mayor. As soon as the chief appeared in the door, the mayor opened his mouth wide primed to swallow him, the gloomy flack, and a little bald man with a single gulp. Hey, chief, come on in, have a seat, catch your breath. Get ready, we've got some of God's work to do this morning. Is that the same as deal's work, said the chief? Abrupt silence while the trans, <coughs> translingual logic of the crack linked up all three Cubans' heads. God equals Dios equals Dios. A short bark of laughter from the communications director and the city manager. They couldn't hold back, but they made it brief. They knew Dio Cruz would not be amused. Uh, the mayor gave the chief a cold smile. Okay, since you're so fluent in Spanish, you'll know what a veces algunos son verdaderos coñados del culo means. Uh, communications director Porto Ando and city manager Bosch barked short laughs again and then stared straight at the chief. 
from their big expectant eyes, he could tell that old Dionysio had uh, put him in his place, and they were dying to see you and him uh, fight. But the chief figured it would be better not to get a translation. So he laughed and said, hey, just kidding, Mr. Mayor, just kidding. Dio, Dios, what do I know? The Mr. Mayor was just some mild irony he couldn't resist. He never called him Mr. Mayor. When he was alone with the mayor, he called him Dio. When other people were around, he never called him anything. He just looked at him and spoke. He couldn't have explained exactly why, but he considered it a mistake ever to buckle under to old Don Dionisio at all. He could see the mayor was tired of this exchange anyway. He couldn't stand coming out second best. Old Dionisio took a seat with a this is serious scowl on its face. So, so they all sat down. Okay, chief, said the mayor. You know this whole situation is bullshit, and I know it's bullshit. This officer's kid, Camacho, is ordered to bring down the guy from the mast. So he climbs up and he brings the guy down, but first he has to put on some kind of ham bone high wire act. The whole thing is on TV, and now we got half the city young that we're sitting on our hands while a leader of the anti-Castro underground gets illegally lynched. I don't need this. But we don't know that's what he is, said the chief. <clears throat> the Coast Guard said nobody's ever heard of him. And nobody's ever heard of the underground movement he says he leads, El Solvente. Yeah, but try and tell, try and tell that to all the people we got on our neck now. They'll just tune out. This thing's like some kind of panic, like a riot or something. People believe well, they, they think he's a fucking martyr. If we say otherwise, then we're trying to pull off some kind of a cheap trick, some kind of a cover-up. But what else can we do, said the chief? Where is this guy, the guy on the mast? Where is he right now? Hey, he's being held on a Coast Guard ship till they decide what they're doing. They'll probably wait a while and let things blow over. In the meantime, they're, they're not going to let him say another word. He'll be invisible. Well, I say we do the same thing with Officer Camacho, said the mayor. Put him somewhere he'll be invisible. Like where? Oh, um, I've got it. Put him in that industrial area out toward the Rowell, said the mayor. Nobody ever goes there except to repair coke furnaces and lubricate earth moving equipment. So what would Camacho do out there? Oh, I don't know, said the mayor. They, yeah, they ride around in patrol, patrol cars. They protect citizens. But that's a demotion, said the chief. Why? Because that's where he started out. He was a beat cop. The Marine troll is one of the special units. He can't be demoted. That's like saying we did the wrong thing and this officer fucked up. He didn't do anything wrong. Everything was done by the book in a routine way, except for one thing. Which is, said the mayor, Officer Camacho risked his life to save this guy. He did a hell of a thing when you think about it. Yeah, said the mayor, but the guy wouldn't have needed saving if the officer hadn't tried to grab him. Even if you believe that, he did a hell of a thing all the same. He locked his legs around the guy, 70 feet up in the air, and carried him all the way down to the water, swinging hand over hand down the jib sail cable. You know, you're not gonna like this, but we're gonna have to give Officer Camacho a Medal of Valor. What? Everybody knows he risked his life to save a man. The whole city saw it. His fellow cops all admire him, no matter who they are. They all think of him as really brave, except they'd never say it, and that's taboo. But if he doesn't get the medal, it'll stink of politics right away. Jesus Christ, said the mayor. Where are you going to do this, in the main auditorium of the Freedom Tower? No, it can be done quietly. The communications director, Portuondo, uh, spoke up. The way you do it is you put, out a, a, you put out a press release the day after the ceremony with all kinds of announcements, commendations, traffic flow decisions, whatever, and you list Officer Camacho's award about eighth down the line. We do it all the time. Okay, but we still got to make the guy invisible. Uh, how can we do that if we can't make him a beat cop, said the mayor. Well, all you can do is give him a lateral transfer, said the chief, to another special unit. There's a Marine Patrol, which he's in now. There's the CST, the Crime Suppression Team. And there's a SWAT team. Hey, said the mayor, how about the Mounted Police? You never see those guys except in the park. Put him on a goddamn horse. Uh, 
I don't think so, said the chief. That's known as a lateral transfer with a dip. <laughs> that would be pretty obvious in a case like this, putting him on a horse in the park. You got a better idea, said the mayor? Yeah, said the chief of the SWAT team. It's the most macho of them all because you're always marching into a line of fire. You do battle. The guys are mostly young, like Officer Camacho. You gotta be in fantastic shape. The training, well, at one point, you have to jump from the top of a six-story building onto a mattress. I'm not kidding, a mattress. If you, if you can't make yourself do it, then you don't make the SWAT team. You got to be young to do it without getting hurt, but that's only part of it. As you get older, you begin to value your hide more. Uh, I, I've seen it a hundred times in police work. You're older, you've got a higher rank, you're getting higher pay, you've got ambition itching under your skin. Every instinct is telling you, you're too valuable. You've worked too hard to get here. Your future is so damn bright. How could you possibly risk it all by doing a damn fool like that, a damn fool thing like that, jumping from six stories up onto a fucking mattress? The chief could see he had their rapt attention. Denicio Cruz's, the flak portuandos, and the little ball city managers. They were staring at him with nice, big, unsophisticated eyes of boys. Yeah, looking down on the mattress from the top of that six-story building, said the chief, damn thing looks about the size of a playing card, and that flat, too. If an older man is there on the roof looking down like that, he starts thinking about some first things, as they say in church. Uh, oh, yeah. Now he had all three of the Cubans mesmerized. Now for the coup de grace. Uh, every year when the SWAT, can SWAT team candidates get to that part of the training, I make the jump myself. I want these kids to feel like, Jesus Christ, if the chief does it, uh, and I put my toes on the edge of the roof, well, there's no way I can make my legs go, go into the jump mode, then I'll be branded as a pathetic little pussy the rest of my life. I want those guys to refuse to fail. For a moment, none of the Cubans said a word. But the mayor couldn't contain his emotions any longer. Fucking A, he cried, that's it. If, actually, if Officer Camacho likes action so goddamn much, take him on, on the top of the building and show him the mattress. The chief chuckled somewhere deep inside. Gotcha. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, some of you already submitted questions. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to start, though, uh, with something that you begin the book with, um, in the acknowledgments even, which is the first people you thank are the mayor and the chief of police, <coughs> who is Irish in real life. You've You've made him African American. John Timoney. Yeah, and uh, so a lot of people want to know uh, why Miami, and once that was decided, the process by which you went down there, and the contacts that you had or increasingly made so that it was possible to gain all of this access. <clears throat> Originally, I. I had the idea of doing a, a book on immigration. I had it for several years. And people would ask me what I'm doing next, and I'd say, oh, I think I'm doing a book on immigration. And the uh, reaction was always the same. Pull the mic closer. Oh, sorry about that. You didn't miss much. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the reaction was always the same. Uh, oh, that's so interesting. And, then, oh, and, I, and they'd go to sleep standing up, you know, kind of like, a, like a horse, you know. And, uh, but it, the, the subject became livelier and livelier as we got through the, um, oh, from uh, 20, uh, 206, 206, 2006, and right up till today. Uh, my first idea was to do, do some research among the Vietnamese in California. Uh, they are in California in extraordinary numbers. It started around the Los Angeles area, down toward Irvine, too. Uh, but now they have 
gone way up into Northern California, in addition to the San Jose Mercury, a well-known newspaper, uh, <clears throat> there was now the Viet Mercury. And that threw me off a bit. A, I can't speak Vietnamese, and uh, B, I can't read it either. It, it just doesn't look like English. Um, and that was just one group. So then somebody happened to mention to me that Miami is the only city in the world, as far as I can tell, that's true, uh, <clears throat> where uh, people from another country uh, with another language and an entirely different culture have taken over uh, a major city uh, in slightly over one generation uh, at the voting machine. Plenty have done it by invasion in the past, but uh, <clears throat> this was done uh, according to Hoyle. Uh, <clears throat> so I headed for uh, uh, Miami, and my good luck was that John Timoney, the uh, <clears throat> Chief of Police in Miami was, a, was an, uh, an old friend. I, I had met John at a, at a table of about 10 people at, at a dinner, and I looked at him. He's got the most Irish face that ever existed, I think. He was born in Dublin. And I just couldn't resist asking him. I said, uh, uh, do you still recruit Irish uh, policemen in the department? And he said, yeah, we still recruit them, I said, but most of them live... Uh, out in the suburbs now, and to tell you the truth, they're, they're kind of cream puffs, most of them. Uh, today, if we want to hire a real Irish cop, we hire a Puerto Rican. <laughs> and uh, from the moment he said that, I was a big um, John Timoney fan. And, of course, John Timoney knew the, uh, the mayor, Manny Diaz, and... I got a kind of royal welcome. They, um, they, they had me give a little talk in, a, in this Freedom Tower that I just mentioned, or that the book just mentioned. Um, and John Timoney opened many doors uh, uh, for me. And in fact, he, I was curious about these uh, safe boats that go, the police boats to the they save people in the water, they save ships in distress, and they, they go f 45 miles an hour on the water, which on the water is, is very fast. Uh, and in fact, that became the basis of the first chapter of the, uh, of the book. And if, uh, a uh, <clears throat> former reporter for the Miami Herald named Oscar Corral, wrote me from out of the blue uh, after <clears throat> learning that I might be coming down for this and said, this is really some place, and if I can help you, I'll be glad to. And he, 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 helped, me quite, uh, he helped me quite a bit. But so that was a little bit unusual for me to be in, invited like that. But um, from there on, I would, did work as I've always worked, which is if I can get along with the first person for five or six hours, <laughs> uh, I'll hear about, I'll hear about uh, other people. And uh, it was thanks to the Oscar Corral, for example, that I discovered Hialeah. Until I got there, I thought that Hialeah was just a racetrack. And the racetrack is still there, but they race things like quarter horses. Um, there's a big arched sign that says, Welcome to Hialeah, obviously done in the 20s. Uh, and you look through the arch, you don't see any racetrack, you see, look like miles of what are called casitas, little houses. We would call them bungalows, just stretching on and on. And, and that's the real Little Havana. Uh, the place they call Little Havana uh, is on Calle Ocho in the center of uh, Miami. And you go to the Cafe Versailles and you get a cup of Cuban coffee. And you walk across the street and you watch the old men playing checkers, and you've, you've seen Little Havana. And in fact, it's mostly Nicaraguans who live there, but uh, High Alia is just, it's, oh, 90% uh, Cuban. So that's how I, sorry. <laughs>
So when, when you go to Hialeah, you go with Oscar and he says, what, this is my friend, the writer Tom Wolfe, he's just interested in talking to some people. To what extent uh, does your rep reputation uh, precede you in places like that? I think most people drew a blank, if you want to know the truth. Uh, uh, but thank goodness, uh, uh, Oscar's mother-in-law is a real estate broker. And so she took me into uh, quite a few uh, houses, and the book has scenes from inside these casitas, which are one story I, and in the back there's usually a little apartment for the, the grandparents. The, in Miami, the, the Cubans are the most family-minded people uh, that I have ever met, or that I've, <laughs> that I've met recently. Um, family means everything to them, uh, and as a Argentine journalist uh, uh, <coughs> said to me, don't ever try to make a, 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 an appointment with a Cuban on the weekend. They're busy. <laughs> uh, <coughs> they're busy with, uh, with the family. Well, you, you know, the U.S. government, when so many Cubans were let in at once after uh, Castro came to power, uh, <coughs> wanted to spread the Cubans all over the United States. Well, they had them in St. Paul, <clears throat> Minnesota, Denver, every place you can imagine. But pretty soon, <clears throat> if you're <clears throat> Cuban, you sort of get tired of people looking at you and saying to each other, oh, they're those Cubans, they're those Cubans. Uh, <clears throat> when you can go right back to Miami and uh, where everybody says, oh, those are Americanos, those are Americanos. Uh, <laughs> And so they didn't keep many people on the side of Miami for very long. Um, and it's a big political force. So you start with the Cubans, and how do you get from there to uh, the Haitians, the Russians, the Yentas, <laughs> the art scene down there? Yeah. Um, it just opens up for you. Talk about the process of, of being down there. How, for example, practically how much time would you spend there were these research trips you'd go down you'd compile notes you'd come back and write chapters yeah. you'd go back again and something else would be brought to your attention mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it was <clears throat> from uh, actually from um, from talking to um, getting to know some Cubans at first <clears throat> um, I then learned about a wonderful Haitian anthropologist. It was a friend of a, uh, a couple that I met uh, <clears throat> named uh, uh, Hearns, who <clears throat> um, turned out to be an absolute storehouse of knowledge about the Haitian community. And, uh, <clears throat> and he and a, a an Anglo doctor uh, who does a lot of work in, in Little Haiti, which really is a place full of Haitians, uh, <clears throat> brought me over, to, brought me to the real Little Little Haiti, uh, and it gave me access to all kind of places I didn't even didn't even know about. Uh, and that's what I always count on: is meeting the people who. Uh, who just happened uh, to know things. And I found that most people <clears throat> are kind and will tell you things if you want to know them. Uh, because of my one contribution to psychology, which is the, the theory of information compulsion, um, I think people gain a few little status points by telling other people things that they want to know and don't know, but I know. For example, if I'm out on Long Island, uh, walking along a sidewalk, and a car pulls up and says, <clears throat> uh, how do you get to Wilkinson Street? Well, if I know, I'll say, oh, you go down here to the first uh, intersection, you make a U-turn, then you come back up and you go, for, not the first light, not the second light, the third light. Uh, then you take a right, and as soon as you get to the mobile station, you take a left. Uh, and by the time I get through all this, they're drumming their fingers on the uh, on the windowsill. Um, but if I don't know where Wilkinson Street is, um, 
I'll go away muttering, who do you think I am, a town geographer or something? You know, why, 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 why are you stopping me to uh, find something like that? I think it's just an ordinary, it's a really ordinary human trait. Uh, it does, uh, <clears throat> about anybody, it does anybody who, uh, it does policemen, I'm sure, um, a, a lot of good, and it's one of the best friends that a reporter uh, has. It's just the fact that um, people love to tell you something that they know and uh, and you don't. That I mean, I'm I'm not at all um, aggressive by nature, but I found if you just if you're a reporter and you have to talk to somebody. Um, you just do it. You just go right up to them and ask them something that they, you know they know, and maybe you know it too, but you act like you don't. Um, and pretty soon, they're feeling good about your being there. Incidentally, that's the only uh, trick, if it's that, that I can think of about reporting. It's a, there is nothing to learn. There, there are no rules, except you just have to talk to people. Uh, or if, better still, Talk to them and watch them while they're while they're while they're doing something. You've uh, you've talked a lot uh, in the past about the differences between fiction and nonfiction and what fiction can gain from nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And the question I have now is: uh, you've just described acquiring all sorts of wonderful information from sources or uh, sources who then become friends and introduce you to new sources. And uh, I I'm wondering uh, about the next step, which mm -hmm. is to say you wrote a novel. You didn't go down to Miami and come back with nonfiction. So, uh, and not everybody in this is this book is, is thinly disguised. And certainly there wouldn't be a one-to-one -one correlation oh, between no. the characters. And so if you would talk about that, that next step of mm. the process of, of turning it into fiction. Well, <clears throat> I didn't write my first piece of fiction until I was 57 years old. Until that time, everything had been um, nonfiction. And I was very excited about nonfiction. There was a movement called the New Journalism. I say was because never name anything new if you want it to, uh, if, if you want it to last. I mean, the last new conservatism I heard about was about the, the fourth in the 20th century. But anyway, that's, that's what it was called. And it was a very exciting time. And to this day, I think that the um, best work in writing done in the 20th century was in uh, was in nonfiction. Um, but now here's what, here's what happened. I, when I wrote The Right Stuff and a couple other books along with it, for the first time in my life, I had a, um, a little bit of a cushion. I didn't have to make some money every week. And <clears throat> so I got the, uh, the idea at first of writing a nonfiction novel, sort of the way Truman Capote wrote In Cold Blood. And one day I was at Harper's Magazine waiting uh, for my uh, wife to be, who was uh, the art director at Harper's, was to take her to lunch. And to kill the time, I wandering around, I went into the office of David Halberstam. He wasn't there. So I was looking at everything on his desk. And, uh, <laughs> and here was an invitation of, by Leonard and Felicia Bernstein to a party at 895 Park Avenue for the Black Panthers. So to me, it was, I couldn't resist it. I had to get into that party somehow. <laughs> so I, uh, there was a, n a number to call if you accept it. So I took a chance on it being a, somebody with a yellow pad making a list of acceptances. So I called up and I said, I'm Tom Wolf and I accept. And, <laughs> and, uh, and sure enough, that was what it was because there was a uh, security check, I mean, not a, of sorts at the, at the Bernstein's apartment. 
um, so you had to squeeze, uh, practically squeeze by a desk, and, and but my name was on the my name was on the list, and I did what uh, my mother told me I always should do, which is introduce myself to my host and hostess, and um, which I did, and um, I think that they really assumed that everybody there uh, wanted to do something for the Black Panthers. Uh, they had invited Harrison Salisbury, a great foreign car uh, uh, national correspondent for the New York Times, uh, and uh, instead they sent the uh, social editor. This was a, something of a blow, I think. Um, anyway, I won't go through the whole thing, but it was an astonishing evening. Uh, but then the old fire bell rang, and I couldn't sit on it long enough to write a nonfiction novel. Um, so I just wrote it immediately. Um, and so there went one of my best chapters. Uh, so I then got the idea, well, you know, people are always sort of sniping and saying that these people involved in this new journalism are just trying to duck the big one, uh, which is, of course, uh, the novel. Oh, and, and when I was in college, if you're going to be a real writer, you're going to be, you, you're going to be a novelist. Uh, although I, I got much more excited about uh, what could be done in nonfiction uh, uh, after that. So I said, well, I'll, this is the time to try it. And so I wrote um, a novel <clears throat> called um, The Bonfire of the Vanities. I wrote it first as a serial uh, in Rolling Stone. Um, I think if I hadn't done that, I would have never been able to write it. You know, I knew I could meet a deadline if I had to. Um, and it ran 27 issues. Uh, Jan Winner, the editor of Rolling Stone, was mad but wonderful. I mean, you know, this is not the era of long serialized uh, uh, novels. And then I rewrote much of it for... Um, for, for a book publication. And it did pretty well. Well, <laughs> and that's why I yielded to temptation and my next book was a novel too. And uh, that's sort of what I've been, been doing uh, since then. But the, to me, it's extremely important that they be realistic, that they be anchored in, in uh, fact, because I have a... My theory is that uh, you can, we can think of our personality, our own, our own personal psychology as a vertical line, where we are bound to intersect with the society. And it's not, one, it's not yourself that makes yourself. It's yourself in contact or collision sometimes with the society uh, around you. And I honestly don't think you can present a, um, a full person without, without doing that. And it seems to me in the great period of the greatest single period of American literature, which I would say is from about 1890, and not the novel I'm talking about, 1893 when Stephen Crane wrote Maggie, A <laughs> Girl of the Streets, up to, I would say, 1939 when John Steinbeck published uh, The Grapes of Wrath. In that period, you've got uh, Theodore Dreiser with Sister Carrie. God, oh, this is fabulous, fabulous book. Um, <clears throat> Sinclair Lewis, our first Nobel Prize winner in literature. Uh, Richard Wright, <clears throat> uh, Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, even uh, Edith Wharton is writing within that, uh, within that period. And, on my namesake, uh, Thomas Wolfe, um, James M. Cain, I mean, it, it goes on and on. And Alfred Kazin once said that uh, in that period, he wrote this in 1942, that it, every novelist, every major novelist, uh, wanted first of all to record every last detail of American life. Um, and they may have had a cynical attitude towards it. Many, uh, uh, many, there were many good writers who were Marxists and had a, um, an ideology opposed to what was going on in the United States. 
but they were all anxious to record. And this country is, is in many ways, quite bizarre. And, uh, and no small part because of uh, wealth, wealth at the lowest levels, not the lowest, but down toward the lowest levels of, of society. Uh, and people now have the, I mean, people that what ha used to be the very bottom rungs have the money to uh, express themselves in one way or another. I mean, they, um, gangsters built Las Vegas. They built the Strip. Um, what interests me is not so much that they were gangsters, but that none of them had ever finished high school. And it's only in the United States, I believe me, that a bunch of people who never finished high school are going to build something like that strip in Las Vegas. This is some country, I'm telling you. I think, <laughs> I think you could go anywhere in, in the United States, rural, urban, whatever, and if you spend 30 days, you're going to find something you never dreamed could happen. Uh, it's, it's a foolproof way to, to write, I think. Um, there are those among my confreres who disagree with everything I've just said. Uh, and they don't think the psych psychological self meets all that muck that's uh, on that plane at the bottom, but that's my... Well, I, I think uh, you're being a little bit modest. You, you make it seem like you could just board the train and get off anywhere and return a month later, having filled up the notebook, and then uh, a year after that, say, hand it into the publisher and a million copies are sold. Um, uh, that being said, it is interesting the way you talk about coming to the novel. It sounds like a Tom Wolfe story. There were <laughs> status points <laughs> yeah. to be earned from <clears throat> succeeding as a novelist, and you succeeded so uh, to such an extent that there was all of this positive reinforcement. You could not resist the temptation <laughs> uh, of trying it uh, again. But uh, nevertheless, I... I, I I remain fascinated by, uh, and maybe this is just a way of rephrasing the original question, uh, what comes after you are, uh, let's say, in the strip club with Oscar down in Miami? He, he wrote a piece for Vanity Fair where he described going out to dinner with you and Sheila and his wife as well, and then uh, the women went somewhere else, and you and he went to a strip club, right. um, and he talks about, in that article, um, you're wearing the blue instead of the white and thinking it would be incognito, but then the manager recognizes <laughs> you. Uh, and anyway, uh, Oscar made a movie about the time you spent mm. in Miami, um, which aired on PBS, but it's to say you've, you visit the, the strip club, and um, it's not in the book as reportage. So I don't, I'm not uh, um, prodding you to, to talk about the alchemy of turning that particular uh, visit, but if, if you choose another moment in the book, say, uh, or that one if you want, um, uh, where is Tom Wolfe, uh, the, the, the fly on the wall, and Scrivener meet Tom Wolfe, the novelist? In, in, uh, incidentally, I, I, I never show up at a scene to do reporting in a white suit. I really don't. So instead, I was put on a navy blazer and all the, all the rest of the gear I still have on. Uh, but, uh, and it didn't dawn on me that in that strip club, I was the only male with a necktie. Uh, I felt like rising up at one point and saying, hey, want to see this new style now? You put this thing around your neck. And, uh, <clears throat> But, and so this, when this, I, that guy was either the manager or the bouncer when he recognized me and um, he, he said, you're trying, and he, he obviously wanted to get the word out somehow. Um, but you, if you're running a strip club, the, the last thing in the world you want to do is report on people being there, you know. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and so I immediately said to him, yeah, I'm Tom Wolf, and uh, this is uh, Oscar Corral from the Miami Herald as if to say, if anybody wants to print this, uh, they're right at hand. Actually, Oscar wasn't still at the Mount Hero, but he could have written for it. 
Um, and <clears throat> our, that evening, I saw things. I mean, it, my, all of my imagination about strip clubs couldn't um, have predicted what I saw. The, uh, <laughs> in Miami, there are 143 uh, strip clubs in Greater Miami. <clears throat> and only in Florida, only in southern Florida, can the girls take off everything. And so there's one girl, sorry. <laughs> there's one girl uh, after another. Um, they do all do the same thing. They swing around the pole for a while. Uh, and then they start across the stage. The pole's at one end. And they start across the stage. <clears throat> and they start taking off their clothes. But they take off everything. And then they get on all fours. Uh, and they walk around on the stage on all fours. And this is so that the audience, which is, you can imagine, all male, uh, can see their pudenda. Um, it's sort of like when you're four or five years old and boys and girls are playing in the neighborhood and say, you show me mine, I'll show you yours. I mean, I'll show you. Uh, not, you show me yours, I'll show you mine. Um, it's at about that level when you, when you think about it. And then come, and this is uh, in the Miami area, or maybe just this particular strip club, uh, comes while they're, all, they're naked and on all fours, uh, a real gentleman will walk up and put a dollar bill in the cleft of her bottom. Um, and then there's a whole rush of men rush coming up with putting, mostly one dollar bill, but God knows what else may be in there. <laughs> and by the time they finish the act, and I, I'm not kidding about this, they look like uh, peacocks with green tails. <laughs> and... I, there's just, you can imagine how many dollar bills are stuck together in the, and uh, then they try to be very ladylike, they stand up and they walk with a calculated gait towards the uh, backstage and these, these uh, feathers are falling off uh, as they go and then they, uh, there's, in this case, two little, uh, two little guys with dustpans come out and they sweep up the bills um, where they go, I, I, I don't know, but um, it's this stuffing the dollar bills and the girl's tail is something I could not have predicted. Uh, so you need, that's an instance where you needed to do the research. Well, you had to. <laughs> exactly. You, 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 in my opinion, you had, you had to be there. Um, and, but, well, there are many... Uh, strip clubs are so funny. It's really the higher pornography. It's really what it is, but animated pornography. Uh, I, I want to uh, look, look at the, the same question from a slightly different viewpoint and ask you um, something which is not nearly as salacious, I don't think, uh, and it's about your, your um, uh, some, some stylistic choices you, you have, I think, in large part, trademarked. Um, uh, I don't mean sartorially, I mean on the page. Um, things like uh, the exclamation points, the italicizations, uh, the all caps. Um, in this book, you do the double colons. Um, could you talk, we talked about the strip club, <laughs> now we're gonna talk about punctuation. Okay. Um, <laughs> could you talk about uh, style? Um, and what you're trying to accomplish mm -hmm. with those innovations. <clears throat> well, you mentioned the exclamation points, and I've been uh, <clears throat> often criticized for uh, using them uh, so much. But my theory is that we think in exclamation points. We don't think in essays. Uh, and I think the exclamation point uh, touches uh, upon that re <clears throat> reasonably well. I also think we italicize our thoughts and our speech much more than you would see in an ordinary, ordinary book. We're constantly coming down on a certain word in a, um, in a sentence. The, um, the colons you mentioned, actually, I, this was a new one for me, but um, in the, somebody will be talking in this book, and right in the middle of it, of this, what they're saying is a six colons followed by 
thoughts. Sometimes it's the thought that the speaker has. Uh, sometimes it's the thought of somebody who's listening, but you've, you make it clear that that's this one, which one it is. Um, actually, it's very much, you know, Woody Allen did a terrific movie called Annie Hall. And he used something I never saw him use again, which was subtitles that told what a person was actually thinking uh, while he was saying the hypocritical words that were coming out of his, uh, out of his mouth. Um, and rather than have always be saying, he thought to himself, such and such, and so on, <clears throat> I found it works pretty well just to have it set off by these uh, colons. Uh, and <laughs> I had a reaction at first, well, we're not sure we can, we can um, type that many periods above one another in a row, and I, it's just really colons. It's, uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, um, I, find it, I find it very useful. In general, on the subject of style, um, I try to hear out loud what I'm writing, even if the reader is not going to um, because I think eventually you'll, just, just the way we pick up alliteration um, pretty, pretty easily, I think I, we pick up also rhythms and uh, the use of staccato. Uh, and sometimes the longest sentences <clears throat> can be the most effective uh, in, to read. For exa example, to this day, I remember, I think I remember, a lead in the New York Daily News by one of their great um, uh, feature writers um, whose, whose name was um, uh, Jim uh, Smith. And uh, he once began a story this way. And this isn't a, we're talking about a tabloid. Who do these New York cops think they are anyhow? A bunch of Russian Cossacks who can go around cutting off the hands of little children caught stealing bread, said Harry F. Matuzovic, 32 of, uh, of 642, uh, South, uh, 642 South Ozone Park, Queens, as he lay prostrate in the gutter uh, in the fashionable, uh, uh, in, at Madison Avenue and 38th Street in the fashionable uh, Mary Hill section of New York. And listen to Patrolman Dominic Ionello as he pronounced over his prostrate form, you're under arrest for vagrancy. And then it's a dash, vagrancy? And him with $5,000 cash in the left-hand pocket of his three-piece Solaro cloth suit bought lately on German Street in London, vagrancy? Uh, now, that, if I said it correctly, is 124 words, and I couldn't take my eyes off any of them. I mean, I just followed that sentence uh, to, to the very end. But it, it has a lot of, uh, there's, a, uh, th there's a, a lot of style in that, like the, the Russians cutting off the hands of little children caught stealing bread. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, he was, uh, I think, it caught, eventually it cost him his job. He was so good it cost him his job. Um, but the Daily News had real verve. Uh, it was, when I was in graduate school, I just walked down to the main street at 10 o'clock at night and buy the Daily News when it came in from, from New York. And I think that's why I first went into newspaper work. Uh, I was being trained to teach, but oh my God, it's a, the newspaper world is a wonderful, funny, wacky world. It, I don't know how long it's going to remain with us. Um. There's an audience question about that, but before we, before we get to that one, and, and speaking of the vengeful Russians, uh, uh, you said backstage you're going to be going to Miami. And uh, what do you hear about uh, folks who've read the book down there? And uh, if they know it's even come out, because you were so <clears throat> inconspicuous. Well, I'm um, sure that uh, the one review I've seen was uh, very favorable. Uh, it was in the uh, Miami Herald. 
Um, but we'll find out when I get there what, the, <laughs> what, what other people uh, <clears throat> what other people thought. Um, there's, as I try to make clear in this book, that there are so many different nationalities, ethnic groups, races. Uh, it's an absolutely fascinating, uh, fascinating city. Um, and I, I chuckled to myself just thinking of, of, of what it was like. But I've done my best to get it, to do it um, correctly, I mean, authentically, realistically, without, without pulling any uh, without pulling any punches, and and I think you can get into matters like race and ethnicity and nationalities and all that. Uh, if as long as you're accurate, as long as you uh, pre present the, a real picture and don't start getting ideological on us, that's the down. That's the downfall, I think, of of uh, so many writers. Uh, Although George Orwell, whom I admire tremendously, saw it just the other way around. He said, he said I never wrote a decent word that wasn't political in its, in its intent. <laughs> um. Should we do some audience questions? Sure. <laughs> um, I've got a few minutes left. Uh, if you had to rewrite Billion Footed Beast again, uh, what would you change, if anything? And, uh, and they're saying specifically with your advice to younger writers in that piece. The thing I changed, I'd leave out all the names I put in. Um, I've made more lifelong enemies uh, uh, by, more, po more by pointing out me. the writers who I think don't use enough realism. Boy, I'm, I'm no different, though. <laughs> More. They'll remember for life. I remember for life. <laughs> the tiniest slights. Writer has his ego on his sleeve, you know, and you try to stuff it inside, and you can't. <laughs> it's my uh, uh, my own personal experience. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> advice to young writers. Well, my advice to young writers, not that they, not that many ask me, but um, is slightly different from Sinclair Lewis's. Sinclair Lewis would have wonderful essay called How to Write. And the first sentence is, first, sit down. <laughs> and uh, that actually is, is great advice because every writer, if he has the time, will dance around that project and dance around it. Uh, it's much easier than sitting down uh, and, and doing it. Um, but despite that, my advice to young writers is, First, leave the building. Uh, and that's because, you know, there are many young writers who, um, in effect, kind of cannibalize the first 25 years of their lives uh, and write a novel that is autobiographical in many ways. And many of them are first rate. Many of them are powerful. They're terrific. <clears throat> but then the second novel, they've got a, three years to cannibalize, and it's about a young man who's walking up a flight of stairs in the Clinton neighborhood on the west side, <clears throat> and uh, he's written this terrific book that got wonderful reviews, but didn't bring him any money. Um, he doesn't have a beautiful lover, um, and he's muttering all hell as he walks up the stairs. This is not a very, it tends not to be a very exciting book. Uh, but, <laughs> Uh, because <clears throat> Ralph Waldo Emerson said that every human being on earth has a great autobiography to write if that person will only understand what is unique uh, about his or her personality, uh, unique. But he didn't say everybody has two. <laughs> uh, so as, as the great... 19th century novelists understood uh, for that the second novel, you've got to leave the building and go look at, look at something else, look at the rest of uh, humanity. Even Dostoevsky, whom we think of as a, such a psychological uh, n novelist, did a lot of, uh, of reporting for things like Crime and Punishment, uh, for example. Um, and Dickens was famous, uh, famous for it. Um, Zola. Zola wanted to tell the entire story of France going from 
region to region, from industry to industry. He wrote an entire um, book uh, called The Belly of Paris about the, the Les Halles, the great um, mark, food market that uh, is in Paris. Um, Balzac was stopped right when he reached the point where he, he needed to know what a, a church service in the country is like. He just put his pen down and go out and, to the church service. And I think it was as it's been natural. I think it's been natural to uh, writers o over the years. Well, not that the novel had that long a history, really, but um, but it's been been assumed. Then I shouldn't even say this. Is not, I'm going to make more enemies. But <clears throat> then, after the Second World War, in my opinion, we fell under the influence of the French because uh, we'd gone through the. 20s, it would have happened earlier, but we went through the 20s and 30s. Well, in the 30s, there was the Depression, and social themes trumped everything else. But after the Second World War, the French invaded and won. Uh, the French idea was that um, it really shows superiority if people do not completely understand what you've written. Um, so that's when we get into the ism phase of... Uh, Concretism and uh, uh, minimalism. Um, um, oh, magic realism. We shouldn't leave, shouldn't leave that out. Uh, and that really just writers whose work I really like. And hey, I'm this time I'm not going to mention the names. Uh, fell into that, and then some of them came came out of it. But uh, oh my God, we still. I think in matters intellectual, we still look to the French as somebody, as a, as a such a cultivated, uh, cultivated uh, people. I remember when in the universities, uh, the philosophy of Foucault was everything. And I happened to mention that uh, to some Frenchmen who said, oh my God, I haven't heard that name in years. Um, <laughs> really? Uh, but really, he was quite real here. Uh, <laughs> So, well, that's what, uh, another thing is that I think, or maybe I'm just talking, uh, revealing my own insecurities, but I think we all feel that other people in Europe have better accents than we do. <laughs> um, and uh, if I were a network not doing so well, I'd do what, uh, which is the one that has Piers um, Morgan? Uh, CNN. See it. I'd hire Piers Morgan. Uh, I mean, we love those accents. They're just fabulous. And we even like the uh, downscale ones, you know, the, the, the gecko, uh, Australian <laughs> accent. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's, that's okay. It makes us, keeps us, uh, keeps us on our, our feet. We don't get too cocky. Though. So unlike Woody Allen in his later years, you're not going off to Europe to film your next novel, you're going to stay put. No, I would just, I would, I tell you what, I would really, and I'm serious about this, I'd like to write, I would like to write the story in nonfiction of the Berlin Wall. Um, and what happened when that went up? Um, the stories, I was in uh, Germany flogging some other book of mine, and it was just after the wall um, had come down, and people were telling stories of what had happened, such as a, a woman let her dog out every night into the yard, a little small yard, and she wakes up in the morning and there's a wall going through the yard and the dog's on the other side. Um, and she says, well, just throw me my dog, just throw me my dog. <clears throat> well, we aren't allowed to do that. Um, I mean, it, it was an extraordinary thing building a wall to keep your own people in. It wasn't to keep the enemy. Uh, it wasn't to keep the enemy out. Um, I went. I was. I did go to a uh, an artist's collective. It was a loft, just like ones you'd find here. And uh, when I on the way out, the the fellow running the show was walking with me, and I looked back at the building, and I noticed there was a hole. And this was 1980. No, 1990. There was a hole 12 
at least 12 feet in diameter in the side of this brick building. I said, God, how did that happen? He said, World War II. This is 19, um, this is East Europe, I mean East Berlin in, in 1990. Um, the, the story of the, those two societies, East and West Berlin, is, would be, and I don't think anybody has, has done it. I'd feel better about it if I spoke uh, German, but uh, I think it could be done without speaking German. You think you'll give it a shot? Uh, probably, uh, probably not, but I'm, I'm <laughs> I mean, but I'm up for it, though. Yeah. No. Uh, another question about uh, books that uh, haven't come into being yet. Before we talk just briefly about the book you do intend to write. Uh, you said something before about Emerson and the autobiography and finding the uniqueness uh, within our own stories. And uh, you, you started writing novels uh, in your 50s. You've now written four of them. None of them is the autobiographical novel. Are you ever going to, for example, get around to telling us about the first 25 years? Or are you uninterested in something like that? I, well, actually, I really look upon the, that period in my life as so serene, I don't really know what the plot would be about. <laughs> um, I mean, I had wonderful parents, lived in a nice house in a nice neighborhood at night. Uh, from my bedroom window, I could see the, the fireworks at the fairgrounds, which was only three blocks away. Uh, and I felt like the luckiest boy in the world. I could just look out the window and see the fireworks. It was the annual uh, Virginia st uh, State Fair. Um, oh, you've brought back so many memories already. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you think that put readers to sleep? Well, I personally don't find it a, a terribly interesting uh, story, but maybe, you know, I'm, I'm just not used to writing about myself. The first, when I first, I was working for the New York Herald Tribune when I first published a book, The Candy Colored Tangerine Flakes, Streamline Baby. And uh, people for the first time in my life were interviewing me. And I found that I was absolutely tongue-tied. I had no idea what to say. I said, my God, what's that person going to write? Uh, and then every time I'd pick up the paper and the story would be, Oh, what an interesting man. He wears white suits all the time. Um, They're still writing that story. And the, 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 the white suits are the best substitute for a personality I ever had. <laughs> <ever. laughs> yeah. So tell us, uh, to end the evening, what your readers can look forward to. There's a book, I think you've called it The Human Beast. Is right. that right? Um, and if it's possible to summarize it, just share with us well, something I, about what that project uh, is. The, the, the term, the human beast, I take from my favorite author, Zola, uh, La Bête Humaine. Uh, I won't get off on Zola, but Zola can write the funniest scenes, but he, obviously he never treats them as funny. It's something touching about the really funny scenes. Anyway, um, so I, I took that, um, I took the title from him. When I dis, uh, discovered that Zola uh, had written La Bête Humaine because it was only, it was less than 30 years after Darwin wrote The Origin of Species and after he'd done The de Descent of Man. Uh, <clears throat> This book is going to be the story of evolution, not m my contribution <laughs> uh, for or against, but just the story. It's a fascinating uh, story. Uh, um, may I tell just one? Of course. It starts with uh, uh, <clears throat> a man <clears throat> named Alfred Russell Wallace who is a 35 years old, is out in the Malay Peninsula. He's a naturalist. And he was interested in uh, evolution. Uh, evolution was, a, was mentioned as early as the mid-1700s because there were many, many people who said, 
that uh, <clears throat> it, it looked obvious that these animals developed from one another, but why? How, how could it possibly happen? So anyway, he has malaria, and he's lying in a, sh he's in a bed in a shack, and uh, he sh has all these paroxysms of shivering and burning fever and so on. <clears throat> and he has, nothing to, he has nothing to do but to uh, while the time away, but re read uh, Tristram Sandy for the sixth time. That's the only book he has. And, <clears throat> or just think. And while he's just thinking there, he comes upon the theory of natural selection. And he's so excited between paroxysms, he writes down 20 pages, and he wants to get it to uh, L George Lyell, who was the great naturalist, he was a geologist. But he, in the Malay Peninsula at that time, you didn't, in 1858, you didn't go to the phone book and uh, find out someone's address. But he had correspondence once with Darwin. So he wrote Darwin, sent him this 20 pages, and he said, uh, if you think this is worthy, please show it to Mr. Lyell. So Darwin, to use an anachronism um, uh, for that time, freaked out <laughs> because it was his entire theory, which he'd been working on all his life, written down as, as if he was copying down Darwin's planned uh, chapter heads. Um, but Darwin hadn't written any of this, none of it. Uh, and he, this was for publication from this fellow uh, Wallace. And so Lyell, like Darwin, was a gentleman, meaning you didn't have to work for a living. You just did something you're interested in. And, and whereas uh, poor uh, Wallace was the son of a bankrupt innkeeper. Uh, so Darwin confesses, he says, he also was a decent man, I mean, he, he wasn't going to just destroy the thing. He gave it to Lyle and he says, this man has written my life's work. Uh, I can't, I just can't believe it. Um, and so Lyle says, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I, was, I warned you that you were sitting on this thing too long. Um, but uh, now that it's happened, uh, there's an extra meeting of the um, Linnaean Society. Uh, <clears throat> And what we'll do is we'll present your theory and his theory at the same time. Uh, that's fair, isn't it? Yes. And Darwin says, yes, but I haven't written anything. He said, that's all right. We'll write an abstract. Um, you know, a lot of scientific pieces start with a long abstract that summarizes. So they got uh, the wife of a Mrs. Uh, a Mrs. Hooker, who's Husband was also a gentleman. Uh, she wrote uh, this abstract for the article, the, the, S, the literature that didn't exist. Um, and sure enough, they read both at this meeting. Um, and you know, Darwin alphabeti alphabetically comes before W. So they read Darwin's, Darwin wasn't there because uh, not only was uh, Wallace not there, he never heard of the meeting. It, it took three, often two to three months to get a letter sent from uh, Malaysia and back. And uh, it's, here's Darwin comes first as well. It, it sounds like the well-known Mr. Darling is patting this uh, young fellow on the head. You know, he did good work also. Um, and <clears throat> the story begins there, but it, it doesn't end there. It goes, there was, there's a wonderful new field of sociology called history of concept construction. I call it the sociology of truth. Uh, very few theories are accepted as truth without certain people handing them to certain other people, and certain important people um, passing them along. And Thomas Huxley was the man who really did that for, uh, for Darwin. Then we get up to the modern period, uh, the theory of genetics against the theory of evolution. They were at loggerheads at one time. Then someone came up with the unification of the two. Now they're treated as, uh, <clears throat> as, as, one, as one phenomenon. Uh, and we get to the present day when we have so many wonderful thinkers, actually, who honestly believe that, or oh, as E.O. Wilson has said, that we're all born as uh, s slips of film, undeveloped film, 
waiting to be slipped into developer fluid. He said, it can be developed well, it can be developed badly, but all you're going to get is what's on that film at the beginning. And this has led to the idea that everything is determined by a genetic makeup. Of course, it collides with the environment, but it, it, none of it is, there is no such thing as free will. Uh, so I was, I go to the meetings about this subject uh, out of my interest. And <clears throat> I went to a, here in, in town, a meeting of uh, scientists and lawyers to uh, figure out the part that this determinism, uh, the fact that you have no, no, no such thing as freedom of choice, should play in the law. I mean, if the person had no choice but to do what he did, uh, how can you convict him of something? Um, and this, was a, this is a thorny matter in the law and in science now. Um, and so, um, in the question period, I raised my hand and uh, I said, well, I think we have a, a problem of reflexivity here. Uh, if everything, if we have no free will, and everything is uh, determined by the mechanism that, uh, that you mentioned, then why should we believe what you just said? <laughs> How, what makes us think that you said it of, with freely? You had to say it. Um, <laughs> now, I, I consider their reaction to be sp sputtering. They, I don't think they did. <laughs> but since I have absolutely no standing in that field, <laughs> They were in no danger, and, and the question just kind of passed. But uh, I, I still wonder, uh, how can we believe what they said? Um, anyway. So are you going around, is this, uh, is this an interview book, or is this, is this reportage or research, some combination of both? Are you going it, to people like Wilson and, and interviewing him? Um, oh, I, I, cert I certainly will, if he's, if he's uh, willing. He's a nice man. I think he'll... I think he'll talk to me. Nice southern gentleman. He's a nice like southern you. gentleman, that's right. Ah, oh, well, when, uh, when my daughter was uh, in the junior year in and, and high school and started looking towards college, the guidance counselor called in all the um, parents of the class for a meeting. And uh, she said, about, about getting into college and all that, and, and, and she said, first, I want you all to do something for me. I'd like for you to just, for a minute, just close your eyes and try to think of the living person outside of your family, the living person whom you admire the most. Well, I had just started reading E.O. Wilson, and uh, it, he, is, uh, he is fascinating, no question about it. And uh, so I thought to myself, E.O. Wilson. Now, please tell me, said the guidance counselor, where did he or she go to college? And you could see the laughter beginning. Everyone drew a total blank. And Edward O. Wilson, it turned out, went to the University of Alabama. Not one of the schools that uh, anybody's uh, sons or daughters in that room <laughs> was likely to apply to. Um, but it did tell you, it, it did tell you something. Uh, Interesting. He just goes on to be the, the greatest intellectual star of Harvard. <laughs> well, that's all we have time for. So thank you all. Thank you for coming. Thank, thank you, you Mr. Much. Wolf.